it's been all about the support of my customers, you know, it's all about the creativity of my staff and everybody that I have around me. I mean, I know it's about me, but it's without them, I will not be able to do it. First was the stand, you know, then the other stand, now the restaurant, it's just the catering, it's just great. Most of them I just come up with them. Uh, some of them they use like traditional Mexican salsas. So. I like all of them, but my favorites are the ones over here that the more traditional ones. But the same with the corn tortillas. They're all they're made especially for us. And they're made in Ohio City too. Well when I started the, the market I had like four salsas, like a few enchiladas, a couple of rices, that was about it. You know, now we have I think over 50 items. That's why they come to the market because they want a, that personal touch with, with you. I'm Roberto Rodriguez, I'm the chef and owner of Orale. The Meet the Vendor series is brought to you by Ohio City Inc. and the City of Cleveland. Click here to sign up for a newsletter that will keep you up to date on the West Side Market's year-long centennial celebration and all the other great things happening at the West Side Market. Be here, Lord. I told you I'm here. This is 
so much for us to get him alone. I'm going to be here, Lord. Now, they probably give my route to somebody else, but that's okay. I mean, I need a change. Well, I could get you a cup of orange mango tea with lots of lemon in it, the way you like it. What I do with that too, Lacey? We have to be here for each other, Mom. She's really trying hard to be strong. I mean, she's a fighter. Both my children were fighters. This is really hard for her. They were more than brothers and sisters, more than twins. They were best friends. So what was going on with that lawsuit? Okay, according to the lawyer. No more doubts? After the yeah, school refused to that. hold a moment of silence with Stacey Donner, all of my doubts went away. The lawyer said a couple of teachers were willing to speak about what's going on at that school. I won't go to my grave until I get some answers. I don't care if they have to change the law, the administrators, or the teachers. I don't care if they have to replace everyone down at that school. I won't let another parent go through what I have. Well, what about that woman that runs that agency for bully children? You think she's coming to the press conference? That's Felicia Slate from Bully Valley. She's coming. She's a wonderful support to children who've been bullied in their families. Yeah, I saw it with Lacey after the funeral. She started Bullies Out as a national network for victims of bullying. I did a lot of research. <laughs> bullying is a national problem. The Crawfords, the parents of that 11-year-old girl who died earlier this year in Springfield, Ohio, they're coming too. All the major media networks have agreed to cover the press conference, including our friends from Channel 19. You know they'll be in room one. <laughs> That's a good thing. I won't stop until the district admits their lack of support for students in their system. You know, I wonder if anybody from the district even comes here again. If they do, it will be to say that bullying is not a problem that Carver High. I can see sure. Dr. Ann Steeling now. She's so arrogant. She'll certainly come in the district allows her to. Didn't you try to meet her? Dr. Steeling didn't have time to meet with me. She sent her assistant to Miss Dora James. Miss James said there was nothing the school could do. She said, and I quote, boys were simply the boys, and it's impossible for schools to stop students from saying things about other students. You said, when you get up, get a watch out. She went on to say that the district didn't have money to police hallways and restrooms and cafeterias. When I told her that's where most of the incidents occur, she walked away. I did speak with the Mr. Edwards, Texas English teacher. Mr. Edwards was a provider of the poetry club. He said there were teachers that wanted to support us, but he also said that this district was trying to discourage them from attending. It's hard to say what people will do when they think their jobs are on the line. Apparently, Dr. Steve said if any of the teachers went to the press conference and allowed themselves to be interviewed, that heads were going to grow. <laughs> we'll see about that. Lacey, what's the name of that boy, the leader of the gang who was harassing your brother? The one the whole school was afraid of. His name is Desmond Fletcher. Is this Desmond Fletcher bothering you too? Has he said anything? I haven't seen him or any of the kids in the gang. If he Carver is an academy school. I think classes in a different complex. Carver is divided into three schools now. But I hear other kids talking. Okay. Most of the teachers, even the assistant principals, they clear him. Most of the security guards even look the other way. He's free to do whatever he wants. Why didn't someone say something soon? We didn't know how bad it was until it was too late. I mean, things started when Desmond was to transfer to Carver. He started targeting Stacy. Most of the kids looked the other way. They were afraid of being Desmond's next victim. Stacy kept it all to himself. He finally admitted what was going on after he let me read his poetry in his journal. That's when I found out how bad it was. I knew something wasn't right. Stacy started missing school, skipping classes, and coming home early when he did go. Stacy always took pride in his perfect attendance at Carver. Then he wouldn't go to any after-school activities. 
When he quit Poetry Club, I knew something was wrong. I had a After I read his poetry in his journal, I told Mom, Stacy kept saying he was all right. He'd be fine. But after I saw the bruises when he hit him, I knew I had to tell Mom. And she went down to the car to see the principal Dr. Stevie. I went down there. I took off from work. Dr. Steely was always too busy to meet with me. <coughs> James kept saying there was no proof that Ms. Desmond Fletcher was bothering Stacy. She said she interviewed Stacy and he said everything was all right. She claimed she interviewed Desmond Fletcher. I don't believe her. She said Desmond confirmed everything Stacy had told her, that they were best of friends. At first she didn't even know there was a Desmond Fletcher in her school. She said, she didn't have a student by that name. This boy is going around and terrorizing students in your school and you're not sure he was wrong? Who of students knew about Desmond Fletcher? She said, no one saw anything wrong. I said, no one would come forward. Did she even try? Even ask. I went down there. I took off from work several times and got the same run around each and every time I went down there. Business will not go on as usual at Carver High. I plan to put a stop to this Desmond Fletcher and his game. This Desmond Fletcher and his game. The boogie made a mom? What? Are you listening? No one said you didn't have a voice. 
I kind of like to say how we feel the chat. Somebody needs to hear me. Somebody needs to hear what I got to say. Crazy talk, that's all you've been doing. I know the time. You would have stood up on our hind legs. I know the time you would have went out to the city, walking too aggressive, two pistols, found that no good so and so, and put his life out forever. Ah, uh, there you go talking crazy again. I may be talking crazy. This is my voice. This is what I got to say. Somebody needs to hear me. Man, we're talking about a kid here. No more than 15, 16 years old. Oh, well, I'm real sorry, but that no good hoop can make no kid. He may be a kid, but he acting like an adult. So if he acting like an adult, he deserves an adult sentence. Where do you get these crazy ideas? I guess I do for my dad. My dad never back down to nothing to no one. You know that, champ. My dad was your uncle. Hill Bell always stood up on his hind legs. He told you that. Right when he started to box down at the Clint Martin boxing gym. Yeah. Told him to box down to nobody. That told you again. Right before he took the ring and defeated Colin Taylor for the life of your waist title. Hey, that's the guy he gave your name. He said, from now on, you Roosevelt. He said, Roosevelt is a child. Yeah. Hey, he gave me my name that same night. He said, you're making so much noise, I'm going to start calling you ringside. He said, all you heard was my big old mom going up and down the ringside. <laughs> oh, shoot. That's how it was. That's how it's always been. That's what we got. That's what the bill could be always done. The way we were taught. I'm talking tradition here. I'm talking what makes us who we are. Bells. <sighs> we go. Deep into the wood. Go right up into the old bear's lair. Rock that old bear up. Now that old bear got to face the music.
Everything my mama gave me money for my lunch. All I did give me a sloppy joke, mashed potatoes with gravy, one oatmeal cookie, and one chocolate milk. Yeah, that's what I got every day. Yeah. Every day I had to go to the that mine. That long mine was to be standing there. Waiting, a whole bunch of us standing there waiting that long mine for our lunch. Oh, man. Folks were mad somebody tried to cut that line. Folks were kill somebody trying to cut that line. Nobody cut that line. No. Nobody but Fanny Rodgers. Woo! Fanny Rodgers had a pair of legs. The law had to cut that line. Fanny Rodgers was walking with a pair of legs and gave her the right to cut that line. Nobody said to me. Well, at least I knew the boys. Anyway, I'll come to the long line as I've been standing. Waiting for my food. No meal chops. Eighth grade. Took half my sloppy joe. Just reached in my plate. Grabbed half my sloppy joe and ate it. Ate it right in front of me. He could just stand there enjoying my sloppy joe. My sloppy joe was not a pay for. I'm going to be down to be that entire school here. Mm -hmm. I ain't said nothing. He got pulled up for me and a whole bunch of other stuff to break. Ain't none of us said nothing. But it bothered me, though. It bothered me real bad. Because, see, I, I wanted to enjoy my sloppy chocolate. My mashed potatoes were baby. Oatmeal cooking and my chocolate milk. <coughs> No deal. Jobs! He want to stop me from doing that. He want to stop me from enjoying my lunch. No, 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 Jobs, he was an eighth grader. But he wasn't that big. I mean, he didn't need much soap to wash him with. He didn't need much dirt to burn. But everybody was scared of him, see. Because he looked like a rat. You know? He looked like a rat. Between my seventh and eighth grade year, I grew about three pounds. Yeah, put some weight on it. So I go back to the Central Junior High, eighth grade, with the money my mama gave me for lunch. I go and stand in that long line, that long line, and nobody but Fanny Rogers could cut. Oh, but that Fanny Rogers can't even cut that line. But she done been replaced. Woo, she been replaced by Sheila World. Somebody messing with the bells. 
that's why I say it's time for us to stand up on our own. Man, these kids ain't got no respect for nobody. They sitting around watching all these rap videos on TV, listening to all that old rap music about being bothered. Being bothered, that they say. Man, most of them doing drugs. They'll put a bullet in your head quicker than they buy your bag of field late. It's different than when we were growing up. If we had to speak with somebody, we settled it with our fists. Nowadays, folks ain't got no respect for nobody. It's got to stop. Somebody's got to stop it. But we can't run around acting like these crazy kids. We've got to take a step back. We've got to think. Times is different. Besides, I'm not going back to jail. I've been there, and I'm not going back. You say this kid carries a 45 semi-automatic pistol. You think he just won't let you walk up on him? You think he won't shoot you? He ain't the only one got a big gun out there channel you just as crazy as he is. What is Lacey? She's across the street in Sarah's. What? She's across the street sitting on Sarah's porch. Lacey doesn't need to be outside. You let her go over there, Lauren? What you need to do is go over there and get her. She's all right. I mean, she need to get out of the house. Everybody's got their own way to grieve. She'll be fine. You get any rest? How can I get any rest? How can I? Every time I close my eyes, I see my boy. I know. I know it's hard, but it's going to get better. Time and the man upstairs will make it all better. I don't understand why. I, I know you don't, but hey, I'm here. Old ringside is right here by your side. Hey, look, I was thinking about going to see the child. What you want? I can't eat anything. Oh, come on, you gotta eat. I can't. Look, I'll get you some chicken fried rice, and uh, you want some ringside? Uh, Thanks, just the same. I don't eat cat food. <laughs> oh, <what'd you> say? <laughs> I'm out. Bring back hot stuff, huh? What, the Chinese man feeling dust in that alley outside this place, too? I'll be back. <laughs> Some real nice fun we've been having lately, huh? Yeah, I remember when it was nice like this, and we was living on East 42. Oh, yeah. My dad used to take me in the chair fishing down here, thank you. Oh, we'd be out in that water fishing for hours. Never caught them. My daddy just used that time to teach us about how to live. Teach us the birds to breathe. You gonna get through this. Won't ever get over it. Who's my baby? I didn't say get old. I said get through. There's a difference. Look, you was the boy's mama. He's your child. That ain't never gonna change. That's forever. It's hard. I mean, so, um, you and the champ? Okay. None of your business. Oh, I see. I asked the champ, he said it ain't none of my business. Ask you, you said it ain't none of my business. Some things are private. Some things are between a man and a woman. Well, I was wondering if the two of you... Lawrence and I are in the past. He's just here to help us get through this. That's it. He'll be gone soon after. Now, there was a time when you and the champ... I fell in love with Lawrence Bell. Lawrence Bell was in love with something else. I was part of what he wanted. I thought I was what he wanted. I was mistaken, and so was he. It didn't take long before Lawrence wanted out. He wanted to leave, but he didn't just want to walk out. He didn't want people to say he walked out on his family. He needed a reason. He wanted me to tell him to leave. So I told him. I told him to leave, to get out. He, he knew I wasn't going to put up with this. Staying away two, three days at a time. Women call my house at all hours of the night. That's how he planned his escape. I didn't know if I was coming.
coming and going. He wanted to leave. I told him to go. Is that what you want? Go out. Get out. Go. I had to take care of my children. My children were a blessing. They didn't need much. They didn't want much. They just wanted love. And they didn't need me. I didn't know how to be a single parent. The twins showed me. The twins took care of me. They were good children. Yes, they were. No trouble I either of them took this bullying and stuff started with Stacy. <laughs> Stacy's not having trouble in school. I don't know. There were no real issues until this Desmond Fletcher transferred into the school. Everything worked itself out. I hope so. God is a great deal. I know. Gotta go. Tell the champ I'm gone. Now, if you need me, call. Me. I know you won't, but I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> but the man says it's gonna rain all day tomorrow. Says it's gonna be easy. Ain't no construction. Over. I know you feel some responsibility for your brother, though. 
but his death is not your fault. <coughs> Sometimes people hold things in that prevents us from knowing what's going on. It prevents us from helping them or getting them the help they need. The things I bullied and then gave me to my brother, he didn't deserve. From what you describe of Dagnan's lecture, he clearly fits the profile of a serial bully. Serial bullies are so angry they're seething with resentment. A lot of times, their anger is fueled by rejection and they have to subject this aggression on others. These kids have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde personalities. They're vicious and vindictive and private, but in a sense, they are not a witness. Only the current target of the serial bully sees both sides. Sees <coughs> both faces. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. One out of every 30 kids is a serial bully. I'm just trying to get through all of it. Are you ready for the press conference? I hope it helps. School districts need to be held accountable. If lawsuits are the only way to make that happen, then that's the route we have to take. My mom says that's why she's going through the lawsuits. As of now, aggression and violence are predominant in the education system. The most popular kids are the athletes and jobs. The aggressive child is the one everyone wants to be around. He or she gets most of the attention. The non-violent, nor physically strong child is always the target. In most cases, the non-violent child will make a greater contribution to society. But schools have proven to be exclusive rather than inclusive. And children form their own groups, or crews, or gangs. Well, at Harvard High School, you're either in or you're out. Exactly. We have to teach children to show respect for one another, no matter if one is in or out. To be in is high on the list of a child's priorities. <coughs> to be out is painfully sad. I don't understand why some kids be humble. Well, children bully for many reasons. You have to find the center of their aggression. Sometimes children are bullied because they're bullied at home by siblings. Or sometimes children are bullied by parents. They have no positive role models at home to the influence of their peers. The rough and tough demeanor is just a survival mechanism. It becomes their form of self-preservation. They feel the only way to get anything in the world is to take it. Sometimes these children have been diagnosed with some type of learning disability, and no type of action has been taken to find out what this issue is. Bipolar disorders, sociopathic, disassociative disorders can all cause a child to become a bully. If a child is confused about their environment, they cover up the, inabil in a, in the inability to fit in by acting out, by becoming a bully. Who made you start bullying out? Well, my sister was a victim of serial bullying. Much like Benjamin Fletcher, but the bully was a female. Winnie Lane. That's a name I will never forget. She actually came to our house and assaulted my sister. Beat her face into the concrete of our driveway until her face was almost falling off. She just left her there unconscious. Well, what kind of person does that to someone else? But since it was a Saturday and off school ground, there was nothing the school district could do. What happened to her when you left? My, my father had to file charges in juvenile court. When he landed, he got probation and went right back to school. When my sister returned to school after six weeks in the hospital, when he landed, went after her again. But the school district did nothing because no one witnessed the attacks. My father finally moved and my sister started attending in the school. I don't know any female bullies. Oh, females can be most vicious. My sister barely survived. I lived with my mom after my parents divorced, and she lived with my father. I was fortunate enough to be in a school that addressed bullying. 
My sister was a victim of serial bullying because of the lack of awareness in the district where she went to school. It was so bad. My brother stopped using the internet. They were calling him names on Facebook, sending threatening emails. They were on the internet constantly. They got a his cell phone number and started calling around the clock, texting them at 3 and 4 in the morning. Because of the internet, bullying can occur 24-7. It becomes relentless. A child that's not actively being bullied fears the next bullying incident. That's how it was with my brother. I'm missing him. I've heard twins can feel each other's pain. Sometimes. Why do you think Stacy took his life? I think my brother took his life because he'd given up. Because he didn't want to accept who he was because he realized some people had a problem with that. What was he like, you twin? He was the sweetest soul. He was kind, gentle, soft-spoken, thoughtful. <laughs> Articulate and charming. He was like, he was like the way, way. You remember the way, way from just over there? Yeah. He was like that. He was a fantastic poet. He expressed his feelings in his poetry. And he called himself the master poet. A master poet, he said. Then he flipped those glasses up. <laughs> Do you think his love for poetry helped him to become a target for bullying? Anytime you're a guy and you don't play sports for a while in the mud, you become a victim to someone. Yeah. Being different can sure put a bullseye on your head. Tell me more about your brother, Stacy Bell. Like I said, my brother was funny, sensitive. He would cry watching a movie or just a simple commercial. He played the piano. He really played that piano. He has a journal every day of his life. His journal tells his life story. And his secrets? Everyone has secrets. What do you regret the most? Then he listened to others. <coughs> then he listened to what they told him. What did they tell him? That he was worthless. And that he should die. <coughs> and that he should kill himself. And he was. He endured their hatred every day. Being caught names, having kids spit on him, take his things, throw chocolate milk at him, and jump on him. He told no one? Not for a long time. Things really got bad once death and such a transfer to Carver from East Tech. Then he told you. I read this poetry in this journal. But you didn't say anything? He begged me not to. I should have listened to him. I should have said something at first. I went to my mother, but she went to the school, but no one would listen. They said without any proof, there was nothing anyone could do. The principal told my mother that she hadn't heard any mention of, of Desmond Fletcher. She said she hadn't heard of the boogie man since she was a little girl. What's your favorite memory of your friend? When we were about 10 or 11, we played title fight. Title fight? Saturday morning. My brother and I would turn our window up into a boxing ring. We moved all the tables and lamps. 
carefully out the way. Stacy is getting bare chested, wearing his little boxes. He always wanted me to take off my t shirt, always saying no. My mother would have killed me. So, anyway, he said, face to face, toe to toe, fist to claw at us, and play title fight. Brother versus sister, girl versus boy, twin versus twin. Stacy always used to talk to John. You would have thought he was Muhammad Ali. He was always the champ. Always had to be the contender. So the main event would begin. And Stacy would call it and get the same every time. The champ moves in on the skinny contender. He sticks the moves. She starts to stumble his back on the road. She's on the road. What is it? He never landed a punch. Anyway, the champ moves in swiftly, sensing the kill. Right, left, right, a hard combination, and the contender is gone! For well, one more, Stacy surprised me with an uppercut to my chin that all was still be up straight. I got mad. I waited. I waited until he went into his invitation to the Ali Shuffle. My fist landed on Stacy's jaw, and he was out. His head at the coffee table that we thought he was to stay distance away, and he was out. I'm talking, he was out. She's been 10 or 20 times. My grandmother was the only mother we had. When she died, we were on home. We're doing fine. I walk to school with every morning, cover with her homework sometimes. I teach her life things too. Who knows? She may be on her own one day like I would. Then what she going to do? She always puts pretty ribbons in her hair. All sorts of colors. She loves rivers. I look out for her. She look out for me. She takes my shoes off after I fall asleep on the couch when I've been out in the main streets all night. It's tough out here in the streets after running to school all day. But it's okay. I got it. My grandmother told me to do three things before she died. She said, stay strong. Be true to yourself. And she, prom she made me promise not to use the bad words like those rappers do. She said, Always remember, God's last name ain't Daniel. 
So I do what my grandmother told me to do. So I don't remember you. My grandmother was my hero. Everybody got a hero. Even me.
No. We were. Not at the beginning. I was happy the first time I saw you at Ringside. We were still young. You wore that ribbon in your hair. You said you liked me to wear them. You used to wear those with bow ties and that little stitching for a straw hat. Yeah, I don't know what happened to that hat. I'm glad you don't. <laughs> I know. The first time I went to one of your fights, I knew you were going to get beat up. Hey, you told me. You seemed too nice to be a fighter. I was just being a gentleman around you. Well, I liked you so much, I guess. I mean, it was rough growing up on East 43rd Street. You had to fight to survive. I mean, you stayed all the way across town in a nice neighborhood. It wasn't that nice. Oh, it was better than most. Back then, you had this look in your eyes. I wanted to be somebody. I wanted to be something. I mean, that was my dream. And I was determined to get it. <laughs> Hard way, my chicken. I'm a They always there. Yeah, I smiled at you when the referee raised my arm. By then, you weren't just smiling at me, there were others. It's not what you did. I got it right the first time. Oh, he fought with me even in the beginning. Everything in life isn't a fight, Lawrence. Sometimes you just let life happen. It's the best way, it's the only way to keep your sanity. That's why I left. You left because you wanted to leave. You left because you were afraid to fight. You didn't realize those two lovely children were your time to fight. You were already a champion. You were their champion. You should stay and take care of your children. Look, you don't have to tell me I wasn't a good father again. You weren't even a father. You have to put time in. It takes work. You didn't want to be a father. You wanted to be a fighter. I sent you money. Sending money doesn't make you a father. Well, some of us have to be a father the best way we know how. Fathers teach sons to be fathers. That's where it starts. I already knew my father. He was never around much. My father used to say, the rain of life is a big old rain. A big old rain with lots of contenders. Lots of contenders coming at you like that all the time. So many contenders, he had to stand in line. I used to hear him tell my mother that every night at the kitchen table when he came home from work. My father had to work three jobs to take care of us. My father would get up at 5 a.m. in the morning. Had to be at Alcor Aluminum at 6.30 in the morning. My father worked at the furnace tent at Alcor Aluminum. A furnace tent! Shoveling black coal in a furnace his whole eight-hour shift. Just standing there, shoveling black coal every day, Sundays too. Sometimes, be over 100 degrees in that pit. Oh, companies like Alcor made money off of parents like mine. When my father would get off the Alcor alone, he'd head down to East 93rd and Cedar to Ed Perry's house. Now, my father used to haul things for people that Ed Perry had lined up. See, Ed Perry got injured a while back, and he couldn't drive anymore. No, he traveled around in a wheelchair. So he hired my father to haul stuff for people that he had lined up. Then he split with my father. Without my father, Ed Perry would have not. With my father hauling stuff for people, Ed Perry had something. My father would get back to Ed Perry's around 10 p.m. He parked that truck, but he still wasn't through. He walked down to Cedar Avenue, catch that number eight bus downtown to 36 in Euclid to the Cleveland Arena, where he worked on the cleaning crew, cleaning up the arena after the arena events. Cleveland pipe basketball games, Baron hockey games, or like when the ice capades or the ice volleys came to town. Sometimes my father wouldn't get home to 12 midnight. Then he had for dinner what we had that day. He'd sit down to fried chicken, collard greens, potato salad, 
candy cans. My mother stayed up and waited for him and made his plate and everything he ate on his plate, she replaced it until my father would say, that's good, I done. Thank you kindly. Sometimes I would be watching through the crack in my bedroom door. Now my mother thinking I'm asleep, but I'm not asleep. Oh no, I'm watching my father. And he'd take a bath. He'd be in there singing. I will be there to protect you. The only words he knew that song. <laughs> over and over again. I will be there to protect you. Then he'd go to bed. My mother be standing and smiling. Then she'd go to bed too. That is my bed. Well, one day my father didn't come home. Jim Henry, the manager at the arena, called my house and said my father fell out while mopping near the concession stands. He just dropped the mop and fell out. My father had a big old heart attack. They rushed him over there to Lakeside Hospital. And my mother took us upstairs to my Aunt Nora's house, and she called a yellow cab over there. She told them she was not leaving without my father, and nobody was going to make her leave. She was staying there until my father left with her. My father lived for seven days. I told you he was a good fighter. He was a real good fighter. The doctor said my father took four or five deep breaths, even after the heart monitor flatlined. My father wasn't going out without a fight. There wasn't a greater fighter or father that ever stepped into the ring. There's a whole lot of ways to be a father. Maybe I just picked the wrong one. Maybe you did. Everybody's not cut out to be a father. I mean, it's hard trying to be something you don't know how to be. Something you don't know what to be. My father and I did the best job we could. Life happens, Lord. It happens whether we want it to or not, whether we're ready for it or not. It's living. That's what life is. I didn't plan to get pregnant. It wasn't something I planned. I was on the pill. I was just as shocked as you were at first. I gave you money for an abortion. I thought about it, Lawrence. <coughs> I thought about it for a long time. I decided I wasn't going to kill my baby. Oh, they weren't babies. Don't man. you tell me what they were. They were inside of me. If there were just seeds swimming around in my womb, they were my seeds. What did it matter? You went around and helped raise them. You didn't even call until three days later. Didn't even show up until they were a little over four months old. I was in training. But I was in training too. And trying to be another single parent. I'm sorry, Bacon. You don't give a damn about how things worked out. You went on to become the great rules of bed, like every champion. Why every time a man has a dream, somebody's got a problem with it. I had a dream. Not like Martin Luther King, but I had a dream. Why couldn't I embrace my dream? I mean, I tried landscaping and garden greenery. I even tried carrying carryouts for the Chinamen. Now, I'm not talking down on those jobs. Somebody's got to do those jobs. Somebody's doing those jobs right now. But why couldn't I do something I want to do? Something that would help me fulfill a dream. When Uncle Hill Bell took me to the Clint Martin boxing ring, being a fighter is what I wanted to do. Now that was a dream that came to me. I didn't go look for it. I didn't ask for it. It came to me. Now, I could have gone by myself, but I thought about it, and I decided to see if you wanted to go with me. Now, I told you, 
from day one, it wasn't going to be an easy journey. I told you. It wasn't you. I told you I didn't want to be a father. I told you if I had any children, they'll be wandering the streets trying to find out where their daddy is. You laughed. I didn't. I wanted to be sure. I mean, you was important to me. But so was my dreams. I mean, dreams take time. Dreams don't just happen. They take time to develop. <laughs> you told me you were pregnant. I didn't hear you at first. You said we were having a baby. Then we were having two babies. I was having a son, I was having a daughter. I told you I did not want any children. I didn't want to father no children. started to cry when I dropped the phone and went back to train. I dropped the phone because I heard the words, but I didn't hear them. Davis had some important thoughts. There were chaos. There were details. Oh, there was victory. It was weird. The crowd kept getting bigger. Everybody wants to jump on board your dream. Oh, it's easy to jump on somebody else's dream. Oh, it's easy not to have your own dream, but to jump and ride on somebody else's dream. But you still don't have a dream. No, you don't have a dream because you don't have a dream of your own. The college fight was right down the road. My dream was in sight, but there was a problem. You were having a baby. No, you were having two babies. There was no time for you. There was no time for them. The hell of fight was right there. That fight would lead to the baby's fight. With that fight, I could go to Germany and have a fight with Hans Berman. And then, the fight with Tyler Chandler. The fight for the light heavyweight Boxing Championship of the World! Tyler and I were both undefeated. Our records were like mirrors of each other. Identical. Like twins. A boy and a girl. We were not all that really. No, we were different. See, I never understood how a woman has a boy and a girl who are twins. A boy and a girl in my life. I mean, a man and a woman aren't the same. They're not really twins, are they? I mean, Stacy, he never had that look in his eyes. Oh, he didn't have that fighter's look. Stacy didn't need that fighter's look. He was still his son. I thought the dream ended in the court. I thought it ended when the jury came back with the wrong verdict. When the rain girl accused the light heavyweight champion of the world of race. I was innocent. They didn't hear me. No, they just heard her. They gave you seven years. I didn't rape anybody. I was innocent. Not according to the law. Look, I'm sorry things didn't work out. Don't say it. Look, Lauren. Don't. Don't. You're the reason that my boy went upstairs and hung himself. Hung himself with your own belt that you left her years ago. Don't say his name. You are here. You are up there. I was there. I was up there in the room. He had been up there for a long time. I didn't hear his TV, his music, his video game. So after a while, I went up there. I knocked. He didn't answer. So I walked in. I thought I sleeping. Curled up in the middle of his bed like a baby. Like my baby. Like the way he would always be when I would check on him in the middle of the night. And then, 
I didn't want him to die. You didn't want him to die. But you didn't do anything to help him live for it. In Madison Square Garden, I threw my last punch. The hardest punch of my life. Fight! Fight! Stop competition! When the champ failed, something flashed before my eye. I was still trying to see what it was when. The referee. He did an eight count. The Madison Square Guard rolls to their feet as one. They started to sing Rocky, Rocky, Rocky. I didn't even smile when the commissioner gave me the belt. He handed me the belt and said, No! Rules are better! was the light heavyweight champion of the world. I didn't celebrate. I was still confused. I mean, dreams will do that to you. I had just went toe to toe with the greatest fighter in the world, and I was victorious! When I do that, I the hardest punch I can throw in my life. Stop! It was the title champ. The light heavyweight boxing champion of the world who failed. It was Stacy. I wasn't sure of it. It wasn't clear, but now I know, I know it now. The moment you called me and said you found Stacy with my belt and the noose around his neck. Yeah. 
crying. He had to go back to work. He just talked with us. Oh, well, I'll drive you to the press conference. I can call Jason and me. No, let me do this, son. I'll drive you. If you do, meet me, see what you find. Put on my arm. Yeah, folks will think on the green side and move up in the world. You look nice. So you're nice and celebrated, Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Lord, I might give me some rich old lady. And yeah, she spot me on TV and simple. I'm going to put this construction job and she take care of me. Old ring side here. I'm going to get a Good luck. Lacey? Lacey, come on, we need to get going.